a Midrash of Ephesians, part 12. Genesis chapter 2, verse 18 through 25. Then the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him an assistant and partner. So out of the ground the Lord formed every animal of the field, every bird of the air, and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. Whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all the cattle, to all the birds of the air, and to every animal of the field. But for the man there was found no equal. So the Lord caused a deep sleep to fall over the man, and he slept. Then God took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. This one shall be called woman, for out of man she was taken. Therefore a man leaves his father and his mother and clings to his wife, and they become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and not ashamed. Luke chapter 10, verses 38 through 42. Now as they went on their way, he entered a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister named Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to what he was saying. But Martha was distracted by her many tasks. So she came to him and asked, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and distracted by many things. There is need of only one thing. Mary has chosen the better part, which will not be taken from her. Wives, husbands, children, household servants, family, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, show the same honor to your husbands as you do to the Lord. Husbands, serve as the head of the family, as Jesus is head of the church. Head does not mean boss. Jesus was a servant leader who loved even those who betrayed him. Wives, honor your husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives as Jesus loved his church. He gave his life for the church. You should spend your life in service to your wife. Jesus washed the feet of even Judas and was willing for his blood to be poured out for the sake of of the church's glory. That should be the measure of your love for your wife. No one in his right mind ever hurt his own body, but treated it with great care. Well, marriage makes the two one. So care for your wife like you would care for yourself. This is why Genesis says, for this reason, a man shall leave his mother and father and be joined to his wife as one. The sacrament of marriage demonstrates the nature of Christ's relationship with his church. When a husband and wife love and honor one another, they become an icon of Christ and the church. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this honors God. The Ten Commandments say, honor your mother and father. Notice that this is the first commandment with a promise, that you may live long in the land that the Lord has given you. The human family, when it is healthy, creates a positive future for everyone. That is why I also say, fathers do not be so strict that you lose, that you cause your children to have angry and rebellious hearts. But also, don't raise them without boundaries, creating spiritual chaos and moral confusion. Teach them how to walk in the ways of the Lord and how to live under discipline. Finally, to domestic servants. I know that because of poverty or misfortune, some of you are at the bottom of the economic ladder, stuck doing the work that no one else wants to do. I know that some of you will spend your lives doing menial, 
degrading work so that those writing your paycheck won't have to do it. I know that you live at the beck and call of your bosses. Certainly, no one would envy you. Don't become bitter, lazy, or apathetic. Instead, whatever you're stuck doing, whether it's babysitting, cooking, cleaning, manual labor, whatever, do it as if it were your way of worshiping and serving Jesus. Do it for His glory, doing it to the best of your ability without grumbling or complaining. Do it with eagerness and joy. And masters, do the same for your servants. However, whatever your servants are doing to honor and serve you, you do the same for them. Here is today's reflection. So what is Paul doing? He is obviously describing a model of a Christian home. But what is this model based on? I believe that the apostle is basing his model of a Christian home on the Holy Trinity. If submitting is the key to understanding the various roles of the Christian home, it seems almost obvious that such an understanding comes from a deep understanding of the Trinity. The Trinity is an eternal community of three eternal persons who live in perfect submissive love to one another. In John 1 verses 2-5, John tells us that God is love. Do you realize that this is something that only a Christian theologian could say? Judaism and Islam cannot say that God is love. Now, it is important for me to say that I do believe that the followers of Judaism and Islam worship the, the same God as, as Christians worship. But their view of God is incomplete because it lacks the full revelation given in Christ. Judaism and Islam cannot say that God is love because love is always the act of self-giving to another. For God to be love, there must be a be loved. So at most, Islam and Judaism can say only that God is loving, but they cannot say that God is love because God, according to their understanding, would have had no one to love before the foundations of the world. But according to a Christian understanding of God, God most certainly had someone to love before he created the world. God is a perfect community of love in which each member of the Trinity perfectly loves the other two persons of the Trinity. The Trinity is a perfect community of love for another reason. 1 John shows us that love shared within the Trinity is a perfect love because it lacks any trace of fear. 1 John 4, 18, there is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. Because there is no fear within the fellowship of the Trinity, each can fully love the other without a trace of insecurity, suspicion, jealousy, or regret. Each person of the Trinity can fully love the other two without having to worry about their own needs not being met. They can be completely unguarded with one another. Now imagine what the implications of such a model are for the human family. If we could even begin to approximate this kind of love, even imperfectly, our families and homes would be the context in which there would be no threat in the thought of submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Women could perfectly love their husbands and children, knowing with complete confidence that she would not be taken for granted or taken advantage of. Men could perfectly love and serve their children and wives, never worrying that by doing so, his needs would go unmet. Children could fully submit themselves in obedience to their parents, never having to be afraid that their parents would act for any other reason than for the best interests of their children. And even servants would be truly free in this context. So it is with the Trinity. We worship a God who is three distinct persons, yet who are together one God. Our God is not three competing gods, but three distinct persons who share one common substance, life, will, and purpose. When we understand God as an eternal community of love, it helps us to better understand God's design for the family. But 
When the family begins to live out this kind of love, the family helps us to better understand the triune God. But what about the church? For it is too a family, a spiritual family. It is the household of faith. What would the implications of Paul's model of love based on the internal life of the Trinity be for the church? Here are our questions. How does an understanding of the Trinity change, challenge, or deepen your understanding of human relationships? Two, how does a deeper understanding of the Trinity help us to love one another 